Okay, um, I know more people are coming in, but uh, I think we should begin. So good evening, I'm Dan Misla, Executive Director of Catholic Climate Covenant. Let me start, uh, first of all, by apologizing for the technical issues we had this morning that prevented us from street streaming the mass by Father Joe Nangle. Uh, we will send you a link to that um, uh, the, on this special feast day of St. Bonaventure. So look for that in your email. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, obviously we, uh, as, as is, uh, we do with all Zoom calls, uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. So like all of the workshops and plenaries, and with your help, we've been able to offer simultaneous translation so if you prefer to listen to this in Spanish, please click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and uh, select Spanish. Uh, as we proceed, I ask that you put questions for Sister Ilya Delio in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible before our time expires um, in an hour and a half. And as we have done throughout the conference, we once again ask you uh, to, uh, we, we once again recognize the deep and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their ancestral and treaty lands. We acknowledge that our conference, uh, conference's sponsoring organizations, Catholic Climate Covenant in Washington, DC and Creighton University in Omaha are on the, the uh, Nakachtuk and Piscataway lands and Omaha lands respectively. So let this exercise be a way to acknowledge our ongoing efforts to rec recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with indigenous communities whose land and water we benefit from today. So please take a moment. Um, I put the link in the chat. Um, thought I did, Let's see. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. It's, it's, it's native-land.ca is the link on the website. So if you're not sure of which land you're residing on, you can look that up and put it in the chat. So while you're doing this, I want to acknowledge the women religious who have been present throughout our conference. I had planned to do this last night, but time limits forced me to postpone this appreciation. So until I became a professional church bureaucrat uh, as an adult, uh, I admit that my only encounters with nuns were the school sisters of Notre Dame who ran my grade school in Ohio. One left me rather scarred, I'm afraid to say, a tall and severe looking nun to a third grader and who had a reputation for discipline, Sister Mary Elizabeth gave me an F for not turning in a drawing assignment. She later found it and apologized, but I'm afraid the damage was done. But in my next real encounter as an adult wasn't until I was a Jesuit volunteer in Alaska and I met Sister Pauline Igo, a Dominican nun from Ireland uh, who was serving the Yupik Eskimo community of Tuxuk Bay, Alaska. And she was one of the most delightful and dedicated people I've ever met who happily endured the harsh winters in the Arctic to minister to our brothers and sisters in that village and beyond. And since founding the covenant uh, 15 years ago, I've had the opportunity to work with many women religious and like many of you have been truly humbled to be in their presence. I acknowledge as often as I can uh, in this work that the covenant's work is but an extension of their tireless efforts on behalf of creation and those experiencing poverty. Let's think of Sister Norman Pimentel lovingly receiving immigrants on the Southern border or Sister Helen Prejean fighting to end the death penalty and reform our criminal injustice system. I think too of Sister Dorothy Stang, a martyr for standing up for the rights of indigenous people in the Amazon. They and women like the Victory Knoll sister, Mary Jo Nelson, who you met last night, pour their hearts out in serving the most in the most difficult places and living Matthew 25 than almost all of us. Finally, one proof that women religious are truly at the forefront of this movement to care for our common home was our June fundraiser. Uh, we talked about that last night. So we not only benefited from the $50,000 gift from Our Lady of Victory Missionary Sisters uh, for the small grants program that we're beginning, but of the $68,000 that we raised above that, 30,000 came from other women, religious and their communities. So those of us who are not nuns have some soul searching to do. 
Uh, but tonight we are blessed to have two other women religious join us. To introduce Sister Ilya Delio, I have the honor uh, to first introducing a member of our board, Sister Mary Ellen Lechieski. Sister Mary Ellen is a member of the Adrian Dominican Sisters, and you may recall that her community member, Sister Patricia Seaman, closed our event in 2019. Currently, Sister Mary Ellen is system, the System Vice President for Environmental Sustainability for Common Spirit Health based in California. In this role, Sister Mary Ellen is responsible for overseeing system-wide sustainability initiatives. In conjunction with her work in sustainability, Sister Mary Ellen facilitates communication networks among her colleagues and works closely with hospital systems and environmental organizations throughout the country to raise awareness of healthcare's impact on the environment and to promote programs that proactively address issues of sustainability. After our question and answer period and closing comments, Sister Mary Ellen will offer a final prayer as we take what we have learned and redouble our efforts to care for our common home. So let me turn it over to Sister Mary Ellen. Great, thank you so much, Dan. And it's my honor and what a treat it will be for all of us to hear from Sister Ilya Delio. Sister Ilya is a Franciscan sister of Washington DC and an American theologian specializing in the area of science and religion with interest in evolution, physics and neuroscience and the import of these for theology. Ilya currently holds the Josephine C. Connolly Endowed Chair in Theology at Villanova University and is the author of 20 books, including Care for Creation, co-authored with brother Keith Warner and Pamela Woods, which won two Catholic Press Book Awards in 2009, first place for social concerns and second place in spirituality. Her book, The Emergent Christ, won a third place Catholic Press Book Award in 2011 in the area of science and religion. Her book, The Unbearable Wholeness of Being, God, Evolution and the Power of Love, received the 2014 Silver Nautilus Book Award and a third place Catholic Press Association Award for Faith and Science. In her latest work, The Hours of the Universe, Reflections on God, Science and the Human Journey, Ilya offers her thoughts for this new monastery to an audience seeking meaning and purpose in today's world. Ilya holds two honorary doctorates, one from St. Francis University, 2015, and one from Sacred Heart University, 2020. Sister Ilya will challenge us to rediscover the place of the human in the cosmos and how this vision can inspire us to have more courageous conversations and take more effective actions as we confront the climate crisis. So please join me in welcoming Sister Ilya Delio. Thank you so much, um, Sister Mary Ellen. Can you hear me? Pretty good? Great. Um, well, really it's an honor to be here with you and I'm so impressed and really inspired by the commitment uh, shown here to the care for creation, to our common collective uh, earth and to our future together. And so my remarks this evening are going to be, um, as I always do, I, you know, I, I look at the good that's being done and I ask myself, why are we still in such a crisis mode? And so I want to ask some challenging questions perhaps um, as to, you know, what are some of the reasons we're here and maybe how can Teilhard uh, help us move forward? So to do this, I'm going to share some slides with you and I hope you'll be able to see them. Um, and uh, I'm going to begin with the title, Can We Heal the Earth? Insights from Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard being that wonderful Jesuit scientist who wrote quite a bit in the 20th century, but whose ideas I think are just coming into their own age. Before I get to Teilhard, I want to begin with our reality. We do live on an earth that is getting increasingly warmer. And uh, the recent fires in Australia, in California, um, the, the weather changes we are experiencing, 
um, are reminders that this problem is not only not going away, it seems to be getting slightly worse. Uh, and of course, as many scholars before has, have noted, uh, this is causing dire consequences for species that took millions of years to evolve, now are becoming extinct. Uh, the glaciers are melting and uh, I know that this has been discussed this week, you know, not only the consequences of global warming, but the effects on the poor, the disproportionate um, sufferings of the poor because of climate change. So we are, we are clearly an earth in crisis. And a crisis means that without any type of uh, reversal of this phenomenon, we can uh, not entertain a sustainable future. Of course, um, again, I'm sure this was discussed, we have here, especially in North America, uh, a very large ecological footprint. Um, our footprint is about 23% larger than what the planet can regenerate, so that if everyone around the globe were to live like an American, it would take about six planets. So we have basically an unsustainable way of life that we insist on imposing uh, and persisting with it. Um, and so we realize, and so here's what's so amazing about this conversation taking place this week. This is not a new conversation. This conversation has been um, in, in dialogues for the last half a century, since the 60s, and certainly by 1992, a group of scientists came together with a warning to humanity where they wrote a great change in our stewardship of the earth and the life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. And in 1992, they said, we are close to committing crimes against creation. Um, Lynn White, the historian, wrote that famous article in 19... 67, the historical roots of our ecological crisis, where, you know, for better or worse, White, you know, lamented that, in his view, Christianity was a prime source of environmental disturbance, because in his view, uh, Christian, Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant, set humans apart from the earth with a type of specialness given to the human, an anthropocentrism, and therefore all but humans being excluded from God's grace. And so what White uh, went on to say in that article is that we created uh, and developed an ambivalent attitude toward creation, which I do think we still have. We're not sure if God is above and what above means for us uh, and what that means with God within. Uh, our language of heaven uh, still for some may point towards something that's platonic that is completely otherworldly and therefore away from earth. Uh, the um, scriptural notion that we are pilgrims and strangers led to the idea that we're just passing through the earth and therefore don't have to be too attached to it. Uh, and so White you know, wrote that Christianity in his view made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. I might just insert here that um, many of the scientists of the 17th and 18th century were committed Christians. Uh, so it is interesting that as White says, and here's really what I want to highlight here, um, in his view, since the roots of our trouble are largely religious, the remedy must be religious as well. We must rethink and refeel our nature and destiny. Now, it is very interesting that Lynn White wrote this article right after the close of the Second Vatican Council, uh, where the church recognized the need to open the windows onto the changes of the world. And yet, something has not really radically shifted sufficiently to change our orientation on this earth community. And therefore, I do applaud Pope Francis for stepping up to the plate uh, and composing the um, encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. Uh, this is a, a, a radical call uh, on behalf of the church to raise our concern and, and be attentive to this, this home of creation that God has um, in a sense entrusted to us. 
Yet, I have some concerns about La Delta C um, insofar as while it is a wonderful document um, in many ways, there is a lot in that document. I find it just a little bit theologically, a little bit ambivalent, if I can say that. Um, for one thing, it is not clear um, how the church really distinguishes between nature and creation and this language of nature and creation. Of course, creation is a religious term, a biblical term, um, insofar as God is creator. Pope Francis wrote, nature is usually seen as a system which can be studied, understood, and controlled, whereas creation can only be understood as a gift from the outstretched hand of the father of all and as a reality illuminated by the love which calls us together into universal communion. Um, and then he goes on to say, the world came about as the result of a decision, not from chaos or chance, and this exalts it all the more. Um, well, I appreciate maybe what he's trying to say here, but is that really consonant with science? And you know, where does that leave the question of nature? Are we part of nature? Um, again, Pope Francis writes, nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. He writes, we are part of nature, included in it and thus in constant interaction with it. But then in elsewhere, he writes, the human being, even if one supposes evolutionary processes, entails a novelty not fully explicable by the evolution of other open systems. And this kind of opened a window for me uh, with regard to the anthropology contained within La Dauto Sea. It is very open and aware of uh, the environment and the sciences, and yet it does not adequately um, discuss an anthropology that is consonant with our understanding of science. And here I think, you know, a little bit to the difficulties of La Dauto Sea is that. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas' theology is the official theology of the church. And Thomistic theology is really woven into Laudato Si, which means that it, it really, uh, the, the, the support and the call for care for creation is really guided by a metaphysics of being. And while I have nothing against the wonderful brilliance of Thomas Aquinas, I do wonder if a metaphysics of being is consonant with the world in which we now know it. Um, again, I think Pope Francis is calling us to a world of interdependency and yet metaphysically, Le Dauto Si still holds to a Neoplatonic uh, type of description of reality. And so I think one of the problems that I think we need to grapple with um, both ecclesially, uh, uh, liturgically, and pastorally is the relationship between science and religion. It is not clear to me in Laudato Si the relationship between science and religion. Certainly we know uh, that we have gone through several cosmological shifts since the days of Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. Uh, to the left here is a picture of the heliocentric universe. We now live in a big bang universe. And yet liturgically, uh, many of our prayers, although they have undergone a lot of reform, still our creeds still can be traced back to the fourth and fifth cent fourth century. So um, how do we reconcile these two bodies of knowledge um, in the way we know ourselves as humans and the way we know this earth um, and its created uh, beingness? So science, of course, deals with nature and empirical knowledge and with change complexity, whereas re religion uh, deals with creation, revelation, and the person as human image. And by the way, these points are lifted from La Dauto Si. This is how Pope Francis is uh, framing the discussion in this text. And within La Dauto Si, while um, uh, Pope Francis is calling us to uh, radical interdependence, there is also at the same time a lifting up at, of the human as being uh, something special, uh, something, um, if I can just um, read it here, that Pope Francis wants to avoid a misguided anthropocentrism 
that does not yield to biocentrism. And so uh, he wants the human to feel a responsibility for creation. And yet science tells us that we emerge from this universe. So we have to reconcile these things. And therefore, I'd like us to consider several questions um, before we get to Teilhard. One is, do we live in a living universe or is it a dead universe? And here I bet if I were to canvas the church uh, universal, we would have very, very different um, answers to this question. Because the answer to the question is how we conceive the relationship of science and religion um, and, and whether or not we see, in a sense, the, the, the way we see God in relation to this universe. Um, do we really want to uh, uh, highlight the term, I've used the term myself for a book, care for creation, and the more I read and reflect on things, is are, are we to care for creation or is creation caring for us? And so maybe looking through the lens of Francis of Assisi, uh, perhaps it is better to talk about creation as a family. Um, and finally, uh, I want to ask the question, um, yes, this is wonderful that we have La Dao Si, but what does Christianity have to offer that other ecological movements do not? And so I just wanna take these questions in turn briefly. First, we realize that to use the world well, to be able to stop wasting it in our time in it, we need to relearn our being in it, as Ursula Le Guin says. What does it mean to relearn our being in it? Um, and of course, I have always used this saying, when the level of our awareness changes, we start attracting a new reality. And so I think our, our challenge before us is how do we shift our awareness of what God is doing in our lives and in this universe in able to form, you might say, a reality of sustainability. Let's just take a brief view of the universe we actually live in. It is a big bang universe. It is ancient, 13.8 uh, billion years old, uh, a very, um, a rather unknown beginning to this universe. Uh, it has been, you know, emerging over time, millions and millions of years. And I think the only thing I'd ask you to appreciate here is the long spans of time that it has taken for galaxies, planets, and eventually intelligent life for, to form. We are a very, very short uh, you know, time here. Uh, much of the universe is um, formed by dark energy, which keeps us the energy expansion, and the other part of it is dark matter. But what physics has shown us, certainly since the early 20th century, that this is not a world of matter, like substance, inert matter, and form. This is a world of energy. Energy, as Einstein nicely showed us, is a form of matter and matter is a form of energy. These two ideas, these two concepts are interconvertible of the same stuff. So since the early 20th century, we have made some drastic philosophical shifts in materiality from substance matter form to energy relatedness and complexity. Even the term quantum entanglement, um, again, this is, uh, a phenomenon that is spoken of even more today than it was than when it was first discovered. Basically, it says that this world of energy, this world of matter energy, is so interconnected that even if you split two particles that have interacted, if you split them apart and chained one particle, the other particle will be affected. Um, and this uh, this phenomenon is known as non local action at a distance, which means that if quantum entanglement works at the, at the quantum level, the fundamental level of matter, then it may also work at the larger levels of human life. Um, as one uh, scientist said, those who fire together, wire together. Or as the physicist Paul Dirac said, pick uh, a flower on earth and you move the farthest star anything we have interacted with that we are forever interacting with and therefore our actions, our thoughts 
affect what happens in the larger whole of the universe. So the term that has been used since the early 20th century is relational holism. If, we, if reality is non-local and means things can affect one another even if they've been separated by vast amounts of space time, then nature is not composed of material substances, but deeply entangled fields of energy. We are fields within fields within fields, which means the nature of the universe is undivided wholeness, which led uh, David Bohm, the physicist, to write a book called Implicate Order. And in that book, uh, Bohm said, you know, as human beings and societies, we seem separate, but in our roots, we are part of an indivisible whole and share in the same cosmic process. Um, and this, uh, this insight, I think, is deeply profound for where we find ourselves today. Coupled with the insights of quantum physics is the role of consciousness, which theologically, I might, I might add, we still do not have a good understanding of consciousness with regard to God and uh, to God to the things of God. Um, but Max Planck, the physicist, but the physicist noted that consciousness is fundamental to matter itself. He says, I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything we talk about, everything we regard as existing postulates consciousness. No consciousness, no matter, nothing. In other words, we can't say anything about anything, including God, apart from consciousness. So this has led scientists to postulate that what accounts for the human mind is already active in the universe. And this is, I think, an important point and certainly has been picked up by many um, in the various sciences. The third aspect of science that I think is important for us just to you know, keep our heads attentive to is that we are in evolution. Uh, it is no longer a theory. Evolution is now, it, it, it is the accepted description of how life on earth, in fact, life in the universe unfolds. And basically evolution simply means that we, we are not static, fixed and mechanistic. We are dynamic, changing and in process. So um, many people look to Darwin to talk about evolution, but there has been a lot of understanding about biological evolution since Darwin. And basically, even as Teilhard de Chardin noted, evolution has come to mean, and by here we mean evolution meaning change and complexity. Uh, and he said, it's a general condition to which all theories and systems must conform. Uh, and I want, to, I want to emphasize that here, that Teilhard um, thought that evolution is a dimension to which all thinking in whatever area must yield. In other words, if we are part of a Big Bang universe, we are part of a dynamic, um, energized process of life uh, in which life is constantly dynamically interacting uh, and therefore changing and complexifying meaning it is constantly forming new levels of relationship. Um, from a biological perspective, um, evolution runs basically on the three principles of complexity, meaning uh, degrees of relationality, novelty, uh, new things happen, um, and future, that as new things emerge, a uh, future unfolds. Now, one thing I think, you know, just from the point of sciences, which is important <laughs> for, uh, I think theologians to really come to grips with is that nature is incomplete. How do we understand then the incompleteness of nature with regard to creation? We haven't dealt with that really. Uh, there are no fixed essences in evolution. And uh, one has only to look at the emergence of the species Homo sapiens sapiens to realize there are many other types of species that precede us and I might add, there will be other species that will emerge from us. Uh, we see that even now with technology. Um, and therefore, I, I think we have to step back and take a more humble stance with regard to being human persons. 
Uh, third, nature is consistently oriented toward new and complex life. Uh, life basically seeks more life. That is the basic law of evolution. Um, and the, the thrust of evolution is on the principles of creativity and transcendence. Life seeks more life, and as life moves towards more complex life, it goes beyond itself. And there is then the level of beyondness written within um, nature. Uh, Taylor Desjardins, um, following Julian Huxley, spoke of evolution principally as the rise of consciousness, that we humans are emerging out of a long process of unfolding life um, and we are, in a sense, the self-thinking portion of the universe. So we not only know, we know that we know, and we can step apart, you might say, and reflect on this universe that, in a sense, has given rise to the basic elements of our lives. Which means, and I think, you know, quite honestly, most grade school children, you know, are um, aware of the science of evolution and what science is teaching us today. And, and therefore, I think we have to be careful when we talk about creation and we talk about the human person that we have a consistent story with what science is telling us from the point of evolution. Uh, another factor from the sciences is that, um, in fact, evolution itself works according to the way systems are constantly organizing and reorganizing. Uh, we have moved uh, since the 20th century from an understanding of biological life as closed systems, which are self-contained, self-maintained systems that have little exchange with the environment, to open systems, systems that are far from equilibrium and open to the environment where spontaneous new things can happen. Most of our systems, including our religious institutions, our political systems, um, and some of our social systems, although that's changing, have been closed systems. And we find ourselves today in a world of open systems. Uh, we are beginning to see uh, the effects of open systems in the way uh, the matrix of social culture, for example, is um, taking on um, new arrangements. Um, but what we do realize from nature is that the way systems work is that they are constantly forming holes that are part of other holes. In nature, a whole atom is part of a whole molecule, which is part of a whole cell. So reality is never just parts that seek to become holes. It is always holes within holes. And therefore the term holon was coined by Arthur Kessler in the 1950s. All of this to say is that while the church is attentive to the needs of the environment, uh, scientists and um, the, the new findings in the sciences today are speaking of new concepts in physics and biology and chemistry that are bringing about a very radical change in a worldview from a mechanistic worldview to a holistic ecological worldview. And this is just one book among many about self-organization in biological systems in which the world is seen not as a collection of isolated objects, but as a network of phenomena that are fundamentally interconnected and interdependent. Um, scientists begin to recognize through self-organizing systems, the intrinsic value of all living beings and, and including humans as part of the strand or the web of life. And so if I just step outside the church for a minute, just to look at the wider view on, you know, what are people saying about the environment and, um, and nature or creation, um, many of them are beginning to realize that, that nature, uh, this world of, uh, if we want to call it creation, created reality, uh, the world of trees and flowers and sun and sky, um, there is a living pulsing, feelingness within nature. And there's all sorts of books, intelligent books, <laughs> to begin to bring this to light. So this, uh, this work, Intelligent Trees, which was just formed into a film, is based on the book, The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolleben, uh, a forest uh, expert. 
And then on the right is the wonderful book on fungi by Merlin Sheldrake, Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures. These, these types of readings, of these findings within the sciences are being very influential for, on uh, the way uh, people are beginning to think about human life within the wider world of nature. So Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass, which has been, she is a um, first person uh, uh, Native American and her book has been extremely influential um, where she says the awakening of ecological consciousness requires the acknowledgement and celebration of our reciprocal relationship with the rest of the living world. And I highlighted that term reciprocal relationship with the rest of the living world. She says, for only when we can hear the languages of other beings, will we be capable of understanding the generosity of the earth and learn to give our own gifts in return. So the term here is reciprocal relationship rather than care for creation. And I find that striking um, given what we now know uh, about nature. And I thought, you know, on the Feast of St. Bonaventure, how could I give this talk without at least mentioning Francis of Assisi, who, as we well know, is very influential on Pope Francis and delightfully so. But Francis of Assisi uh, probably would not have used the term care for creation because he lived in this creation as family. And I think just briefly, I just want to touch upon uh, how he entered into this worldwide web of created beingness. First, it was his economy of attention. Um, he was deeply um, uh, attentive to, to the goodness of God present in all living beings. Francis was, um, he was a very simple person and therefore he met God precisely in, uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, in the human person, the human person who died on a cross. And therefore this, this notion of incarnation the indwelling presence of God spoke very, very poignantly to him. Um, for, for, for Francis, creation was a finite expression of this infinite love of God, a, a world overflowing with the goodness of God, uh, something that Pope Francis does um, uh, admit to in Laudato Si, where he says creation is of the order of love. God's love is the fundamental moving force in all created things. But the way Francis of Assisi lived in this love was not by, by doing something, but by being in a particular way. And that was stripped of all possessions. In other words, not so much living without material things, but living without possessing things, sine proprio. Uh, and therefore to live without possessing is to live therefore as Pope Francis uh, says many times about Laudato Si, in this, in this world of goodness as gift, everything is gift and given. Um, and therefore, I think the giftedness of creation allowed Francis to, to taste and see and experience this, this hidden presence of God's goodness, goodness in the simple ordinariness of being, the, the, the robin and, and the tree, Everything was gift and therefore every aspect of creation, which he did spend enormous amounts of time in. He did not have a watch. He did not, he did not have Zoom. He simply sat in nature and uh, allowed God to speak to him through the gift of all of nature. And therefore he found himself as a brother uh, to all creatures and identified with them as brother and sister brother, uh, brother, son, sister, moon, sister, birds. And therefore his was this descending solidarity between humans and creation. In a sense for, for Francis, where every aspect of, of, cre of, of nature um, was the place to worship God and the place to celebrate God's goodness. So that, you know, even for worms, uh, Thomas of Tolano wrote, he had a warm love and he would treat these worms with delicate handling. Um, he used to pick them up from the side of the road and 
place them in a safe place so they wouldn't be crushed. Um, when he found flowers, he would preach to them and invite them to praise the Lord as if they were endowed with reason. If we were to do some of these things today, we wouldn't, first of all, because we're so self-conscious that others would be looking at us. And yet, um, Francis had a great freedom uh, to, to live as a brother of creation, which then allowed the theologians Bonaventure and, and Scotus to recognize that God is at the heart of every aspect of this beautiful planet. And therefore Scotus spoke about the primacy of Christ. Christ is first in God's intention to love. Um, and it led Bonaventure to say that Christ shares existence with each and everything, with stones and plants and animals. Um, since Christ in his human nature, he says, embraces something of every creature in himself when he was transfigured. All of this to say, um, beginning with our new sciences uh, story, the Big Bang story, through the Franciscans, to say that the person of Teilhard de Chardin uh, bears all these influences in his own theology. Um, and I, I, I wanted to give that background because I think Teilhard has been too readily dismissed. Uh, many theologians today pay no regard to what he has to say. Um, and many find him too anthropocentric, too naive, too optimistic. I've heard all these things over and over. And I think, I think it's, these are misguided and misunderstood uh, ideas on Teilhard's um, insights. For one thing, he was a scientist and he wrote as a scientist. He was also a Jesuit priest and very committed to the Jesuit order. And it was these two things, um, a deep love for the church, a deep love of Christ, and yet um, a commitment to science that, that impelled him to bring together Christianity and evolution. And in one of his essays, he asked, who will give evolution its own God? That is a very powerful question that we have yet to really uh, address. And what he felt is that Christianity uh, had become too passive. It, had, it was still too married to Greek metaphysics. It really had nothing, um, it could not really offer to the world uh, what it potentially contained within it, and that is the power of a dynamic loving God. Um, and therefore, I think it's just helpful to know some of the principles he built his ideas on. The first is that the universe is unfinished. It is still coming into being. Uh, it is not perfected. Um, and this means in an unfinished universe that we humans are part of this universe and therefore we contribute to what this universe becomes. The second is um, his notion of creative union. In fact, he didn't, Teilhard did not speak about creation. He spoke only in terms of creative union. In his view, God and world are complementary uh, are form a complementary pair. Uh, so to create is to unite. The world comes into being and becomes something new by a process of unification. That is certainly true of evolution. Third is that union differentiates. That as things come together, and as it, certainly as we see in Christ, God seeks to become continually more incarnate in the world, not by establishing uniformity, but by a differentiating, liberating, and personalizing communion with it. Um, this is what he means by a Christified universe. It's the beauty of every particular beingness that bears within it uh, the love of God. Fourth, he says the world rests on the future as its sole support. It, in this unfinished universe, we are moving towards something, um, which is, of course, very consonant with scriptures, right? We anticipate a new heaven and a new earth. Um, as we follow this course of cosmic history from its remote past into the future, there is a law of recurrence, he said, in which something new and more complex and more conscious is always taking shape up ahead. Why is this important? Because Teilhard's principles mean that we have to shift our thinking about theology and about the church into principles that can engage dynamic becoming, uh, creativity, and transcendence. Um, Teilhard really spoke about 
um, all of matter, he says, has within it two aspects, a withinness or a mental component and a withoutness or a physical component. So all of matter is constantly being attracted to one another and transcending itself. Um, and of course, you know, the core energy that bears within it both the level of attraction and transcendence is love. And Teilhard said, you know, from the smallest particles of the universe up to the human person, um, that love is a constant source of attractive energy. And he went on to say, the physical structure of the universe is love. So basically for Teilhard, the universe has a physical and psychic character. In other words, there's something going on here that's more than mere matter. Rather, matter has a numinous uh, quality to it. And therefore, matter and spirit are not two separate things that are related. Spirit is the higher portion of matter, the energy matrix of matter. Um, and therefore, Teilhard places, you might say, the whole of theology within this material matrix. So that religion is not something that's added on to us. <laughs> religion is the depth dimension of this psychic physical universe that led him to say religion and evolution belong together. Now, um, you know, that may be a lot to take in in a short amount of time, uh, given uh, the broad sweep of things here. But, you know, I think in, in, a, in a basic way, he's saying that there is a dynamic presence, um, you know, at the heart of, of evolution, at the heart of this cosmic life that both sustains this cosmic life towards more life and is pulling it on towards more conscious life. And he called this presence omega. And of course, that's a very scriptural term, God revealing itself as the alpha and the omega. And therefore, for Teilhard, very simply, God is within and God is ahead. God is the center of every center. And God, you might say, is the, the goal, the omega, the fulfillment of all that we can become um, in the future. Um, but the term that you might say better describes what Teilhard is getting at here is not just a new God of heaven and earth. It is rather that... Um, God is the infinite source and depth and breadth of matter. And maybe what I want to say here and what Taylor really is contributing to us is a new understanding of the theology of matter. Uh, that matter really matters. It's not just something that is helpful to us or that we just you know, may tend to. Um, it really is the place where God is revealing God's self. And so the term used here is cosmotheantric holism. Cosmos Theos and Anthropos are an intricate, a Trinitarian whole that cannot be separated. And so that's really, Teilhard, Teilhard de Chardin's vision is a deeply incarnational vision. And if I had more time, I would, I would spend a lot more time comparing it with uh, Franciscan spirituality because he is deeply Franciscan. And I always say, had Teilhard become a Franciscan, we might have published his writings, but that's okay. He became a Jesuit. But really what he's saying is God is not found through opposition to matter or independent of matter, but through matter. And I'm not sure uh, in the church at large that we really have an adequate theology of incarnation that allows us to truly appreciate um, um, a God who is thoroughly and deeply united with matter. So that material reality does not exist as a self-contained order but bears within it a drive toward the spiritual. It's precisely because of the divine depths of matter, if we can use that term, that Teilhard said, there is nothing profane below here for those who know how to see. And that is you know, really true. If, if we can see, as Francis of Assisi saw, there is nothing that's just a mere tree or a mere leaf or a mere bird every single aspect of creation is radiating divine love. Teilhard himself um, you know, wrote about how he found the absolute within the experience of matter that drew him and yet remained hidden. Um, as Father Thomas King wrote, he seemed to sink down into matter 
that primordial essence from which all emerges and to which all returns. So, uh, so he was a biologist who saw in matter the depths of matter that belonged to God. Which means then he, because of this vision of Teilhard, he could then begin to look at evolution as um, you might say, the divine uh, depths, God's love immersed within the material world now rising up uh, in and through consciousness. And so he used the term Christogenesis, that Christ is being born in the universe um, through the processes of cosmogenesis, uh, biogenesis, and now on the level of mind or neugenesis. Um, which, you know, again, he does not have a developed Christology uh, that, that needs to be built on some of his ideas. But what we can say is that Teilhard did, did recognize that Jesus, Jesus Christ um, does, you know, you might for, say, uh, uh, signify a significant turn in the life of the universe. Something new emerges within this life of Jesus of Nazareth, um, a new consciousness, a new way of being in the world, a new structure of existence. And so Jesus is then um, model exemplar, savior, redeemer, not so much in rescuing us from a fallen world, but in a sense, in showing us how to create wholes, to be whole, to be whole and holy, you might say, in this unfinished universe. And so, you know, intrinsic to the life uh, of, of new life is suffering and death. Um, and here I would say all of evolution runs on, you know, on the fact that uh, suffering and sacrifice are part of the move toward more complex life. Um, isolated existences give up their isolation to become something more in union with one another. And I think Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ uh, it, it symbolizes what this capacity is, not only for uh, nature itself, but for the human person that we are called to become a new type of person, a new structure of existence. Um, and that new structure of existence will entail for us suffering, death, and new life. Um, the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus has those words, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and will do greater works than these because I go to the Father. And therefore, see, Jesus sort of anticipates that we will not only continue the work that he began, but we will, uh, we will exceed it. And therefore, the term that's used today um, is created co-creator. God cannot create a new world without us, but not God will not create a new world despite us. It takes our, our involvement. It takes exactly what we're doing here, right? To be conscious of the problem, to find ways to participate in how we can work together to build a new earth. Um, because we know biological evolution has not ended with, that, with us, that we are part of this cosmic process that demands our commitment to it. The, the thing is though, we cannot stay as we are. Uh, I think Jesus again, you know, in, it points to the fact that new wine must be put into new wineskins. And, and we have yet to adequately assess what is the new wine for us and what are the new wine skins. Teilhard himself really called, uh, and I do think a lot of his writing was a call to the church uh, that really didn't want to hear too much from him. But it was about a faith in God, a faith in the world, and then a faith in God in and through the world. And by that last point, he meant where there is God, there is trust, there is freedom, there is courage, there is the will to do new things. And that's what he meant. Um, just as nature, you know, can spontaneously do new things, we are called as, as humans, as Christians, as people of the church to do new things. Um, and, and Teilhard himself spoke about a new religion of the earth. I don't think he was opting for anything other than a renewed Christianity. Uh, because in his view, we have, you know, we have yet to really enter into the fullness of what uh, Christianity has to offer. 
So Tara says, in the future, the only religion possible is the religion which will teach us in the very first place to recognize, love, and serve with passion the universe of which we form a part. That is an incarnational statement. That is an incarnational religion at its root. Thomas Berry wrote, the ultimate concern of the human must be the integrity of the universe upon which the human depends in such an absolute manner. This is what it means to be oriented toward heaven. Heaven is the openness of the earth to its completion in God, and the completion in God is the full flowering of love. And so this, this movement toward heaven uh, is not a detachment from the earth. It is the fulfillment of what we are called to. My last point really refers to the way Teilhard spoke of the church as a new phylum of love. In some ways, I do think Pope Francis would like to move in this direction. So many of his recent writings are, you know, on mercy, forgiveness, and love. And yet, there are things I think that still need to take place. Uh, for one, Teilhard de Jardin said, we don't need so much a teaching church, but a living church. And I think there's something to that. We have to live these ideals that we are espousing. Um, he spoke of the community of the church as pleromizing, full, fulling, <laughs> a fulfilling community as part of the evolutionary process where we are contributing to the world's potentialities to become something more than what it is in God. In this respect, um, Teilhard spoke briefly of the liturgy as creating a new type of person. We might say a Christic species, an ultra-human species, an entanglement with the living body of Christ. Um, I think sometimes our liturgy is, is yet not sufficiently empowering us to be truly uh, part of an interconnected web of life. Um, ritual uh, should be a sacramental or symbolic act in Tarot's view that acts to Christify the world, that we go forth from the liturgy and see this world of creation and human persons and every aspect of life imbued with this love of God. And so Tarot said that a new understanding of, of evolution uh, requires a new type of worship and a new form of action. He himself composed a different creeds. And we might consider a creed for creation, maybe in our liturgy, not to displace the Nicene Creed, but maybe as, you know, to supplement it. This is just an example of one where we can say, I believe in the deepest, we, should, we really should say, we believe in the deepest goodness of things, in the relationship of all things. We are entangled with all earth life and all living creatures. We believe the future is the relational unity of all things in God. We believe this earth has a future entangled with God and that the heart of God is love. Because what we profess in that creedal belief is in a sense how we shape our lives. Teilhard, you know, uh, uh, spent most of his life in the deserts of China as a paleontologist. And at one point, he, he was really in the midst of the desert with no ability to celebrate uh, the mass. And therefore, he composed this beautiful mass in the world where he wrote, since once again, Lord, I have neither bread nor wine nor altar, I will raise myself beyond these symbols up to the pure majesty of the real itself. I, your priest, will make the whole earth my altar and on it will offer you all the labors and sufferings of the world. Do we recognize the earth as the first altar where the sacrifice, where this body of Christ is lifted up? Um, in Teilhard's view, we can, in a sense, participate in this act of self-offering in every aspect of our lives, in his words, over every living thing which is to spring up, to grow, to flower, to ripen during this day, I say again the words, this is my body, our sufferings for the day, this is my blood. So that what he's saying is that, you know, liturgy or the mass is not a privatized matter. This is the place where an ecological community is to be forming. And therefore, Teilhard's contribution is this, very simply, the universe is holy. I don't think 
And that's anything different than what Pope Francis is saying. It has meaning and purpose. God is dynamically and creatively united to matter. God is doing new things. And sometimes I don't think we have sufficient emphasis on the fact that God is doing new things and God is doing new things in and through us. We are co-creators of this unfinished universe and we are dependent on this universe and, and, and the life forms within it. The universe is oriented toward the fullness of Christ. That is not an exclusive, uh, an, um, an exclusive statement. And here's where, you know, again, um, the fullness of Christ in Teilhard's view requires the convergence of world religions. It means that we are open to sharing uh, with other, other people of faith our concerns for the earth, how to, how to work together, to be together, to live together, to love together. Um, and, you know, all of this for Teilhard is driven by the energies of love. So I'm going to wrap this up with a few slides um, before we uh, break this open for some questions. Thomas Berry, writing back in the 70s and 80s, said this. He said, the ecology movement exists in its own right. It has inherently religious dimensions. It does not need biblical verification or consecration. Those committed to care of the earth are fulfilling a sacred task. And I think I have to be honest here, uh, he hit kind of, you know, he had his finger on the pulse back then. Many young people today are deeply concerned for the care of the earth. Uh, they're, they're concerned for the plight of the poor. They're concerned about global warming, at least many of my undergraduate students, but they also have deinstitutionalized themselves. Many of them are nuns, spiritual, but not religious. Um, and some of them might see their care for the earth as fulfilling a sacred task. Thomas Berry went on to say the reason for Christian aversion to the story of an emergent universe is that the story has generally been told simply as a random physical process, when in reality it needs to be told as a psychic spiritual as well as physical mental process from the beginning. Uh, and I, again, I have to say, we need to we need to pay attention to this. Are we just are we just paying lip service to science and and still espousing a spiritual story of creation? That's not going to work, and, and uh, it will not attract younger generations. Um, we need we need a narrative of of a Christian narrative that is consonant with the Earth story. So that, as Thomas Berry said, the universe story, the Earth story, the life story, and the human story are all a single story. You know, I guess I would raise the questions because our primary uh, formation really does take place during the liturgy, uh, the way um, uh, preaching, liturgical preaching, celebration. Does the liturgy uh, celebrate the universe story, story as a sacred story? My experience uh, is no, um, that we still celebrate liturgy uh, even, even after Vatican II with a, a slightly Neoplatonic a flavor to it. Um, does the church fully accept the scientific understanding of the Big Bang and evolution as the primary source of revelation? Uh, I don't think so because the way it's articulated, the book of scripture and the book of nature. Um, and of course, these are not competing books, but neither are they the same book. And that can be problematic, I think, unless we begin to reconcile um, where, how revelation takes place. How does the liturgy model, uh, how does the liturgy model ecological interdependence? How do we, how do we celebrate this liturgy and talk about ecology as it's something that we're supposed to be doing? When in fact the whole of ecclesia of liturgy is a gathering intercommunity. The whole of liturgy should be a modeling of interdependent life. Fourth, how do we liturgically worship God in an unfinished universe? What kind of God do we imagine is at work in our world today? Uh, there's a lot that can be said here and Teilhard himself had some very interesting ideas on theology and evolution. Finally, I would ask, does the church model a new phylum of love? Yes, we can blame culture. Yes, we can blame consumerism. We can blame technology. Um, we can blame money 
for the ills of global warming. But I'd rather step back and say, is there something that as church we have not yet achieved, that we have not yet attained, or maybe we have even failed in doing? Um, the church must be a model for the very principles it wants to espouse. Do we, do we show ourselves to be a new Christic species? Do we show ourselves to be persons who have now put on Christ? I don't know. It seems at times, uh, if we take, um, you know, some of the positions of the church on not just ecology, uh, but on various other positions, um, it seems not. We have a very divided church. Uh, we're divided theologically, ideologically, and therefore, uh, I think we have some work to do uh, to clean our, our, you know, our inside of our house in order that the outside may radiate this love of God that we so cherish. Thomas Berry said, the human community and the natural world must be seen as a unified single community with an overarching purpose, the exaltation and joy of existence, praise of the divine and participation in the great liturgy of the universe. I do not think that God is the problem, that liturgy is the problem. These are all wonderful. And I think if we can begin to bring science and religion into a discourse where they are mutually enriching one another, that we can begin to realize that the God whom we seek and desire is the God who is present in all aspects of, of this great, big, wonderful world. Um, and celebrate this, this place of the earth as the place where of divine revelation, um, we can begin to see church emerge in a new way. Um, I, I close with the words of Bonaventure whose feast we celebrate today uh, because they are still very appropriate. Bonaventure wrote uh, in 1259, he wrote, therefore any person who is not illumined by such great splendor in created things is blind. Anyone who is not awakened by such great outcries is deaf. Anyone who is not led by such effects to give praise to God is mute. Anyone who does not turn to the first principle as a result of such signs is a fool. Therefore, open your eyes, alert your spiritual ears, unlock your lips and apply your heart so that in all creatures, you may see, hear, praise, love and adore, magnify and honor your God, lest the entire world rise up against you. Thank you. Oh my, um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sister Ilya. That was amazing. Um, the uh, chat and uh, the questions, well, the chat is lit up. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't been able to follow it, but it's, it's really quite astonishing uh, the impact that you have had. Uh, in, in this uh, wonderful talk. I'm going to um, ask a few questions and um, see if we can get as many as possible in. So I promise to keep them short. And um, so the first question, I think it was way back in the beginning when you were talking about systems and Bill asked, do closed systems die? Uh, yes, uh, Bill, they do. Closed systems will die unless there's new energy put into those systems. So a closed system is a bounded system. In other words, um, you have to put um, energy into the system. Uh, the system will use up that energy. If no new energy is put into the system, the system will die out. And, and that's why because of evolution, we began to realize that most systems today are open systems, which means they work, they work far from equilibrium. There's always spontaneity. There <coughs> Uh, and, and disequilibrium, and but they're open to new, 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 new stimuli, new, new ways of order. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, from Fran Ludwig, Elizabeth Johnson speaks of kinship, of the kinship we share with creation. Can you think of other names for our creation care teams that might better convey convey this kinship? For example, like kingdom, yeah. <laughs> like kingdom come. Yeah, that, no, I know, I know we're looking for language and I appreciate that. You know, kin is good. I like kinship, but I, I don't think, I personally, here's my little Franciscan bent. I love brother and sister, like family, you know, we truly are related. You know, how do we, how do we, 
uh, convey, how do we, how, let me ask this way. How do we experience our relationship to all creaturely life? You know, to the trees, to the leaves. Do I see myself as a sister? Is that, is that tree a sister to me? Am I just kin? Are we cousins? Are we distant cousins, second cousins? Are we deeply interconnected? And here I think, you know, I, I want to find language and maybe um, I don't have enough, you know, I don't have enough new terms here, but we need to find language of deep interconnectivity. Like um, we're, we're, we're flowing in the same bloodstream, so to speak, you know, the same energy bloodstreams. So maybe, I don't know, I have no good, good, no good answer. Keep kinship until we come up with something better. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, from Linda uh, Gibbler, how does deep incarnation, Dennis Edwards and others, continue Teilhard's understanding of incarnation? Yeah, excellent question. And um, that's exactly what it is. I think that term deep incarnation from Niels Grigerson and others and Dennis Edwards is exactly what we're saying is God enters into the tissues, into the cells, into the, into the energy fields themselves. There's no aspect of created reality that's left outside um, uh, of divine reality, divine love. Um, and so God, you know, God deeply present in every single molecule and atom and quark of the universe. Um, and that we're, we're part of that. We're part of that whole flow of matter energy. So when we speak of deep, deep, on, deep incarnation is actually a better term for us not only to use, but to build on theologically. And, and I do think, you know, if we, if we were to bring that term into the liturgy itself, that we're, that we're, um, that we're not just celebrating Jesus Christ, but we're celebrating the deep incarnation of God's word incarnate, yeah. There's a couple questions about suffering. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll read this one. Um, Okay, uh, he says, okay, here's a big question. How do we reconcile the claims that one, God is love, as in John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 8, two, love is willing and acting for the good, which is from Aquinas, and three, God creates and evolutionary world permits or requires destruction of creation that God loves. Yeah, but it's how we're thinking about these things. So, you know, it's not that... Um, I, I, I put it this way, I mean, let, let's look back, you know, at 13.8 billion years of, of uh, cosmic evolution, and then 142,000 years of human life and 4.2 billion years of Earth life. These are long expanses of time, long expanses, and we're here. We are here after long expanses of time in which, in which much of life has undergone uh, destruction, has undergone suffering. I'm not saying these are good. What we are saying is life seeks more life and uh, suffering and death are part of that emergence toward more life. If we only focus on the suffering and death, if we say that's it, you know, God, God is love, you see, and he allows this suffering. No, love, love seeks the fullness of life and will not stop until that fullness of life, um, you might say, is realized. And therefore, suffering, I think, you know, and I don't want to reduce, because suffering can be seen in two ways. We suffer for lack. We can suffer because we've lost, but we can suffer out of, out of great desire. I think God suffers with us out of an abundance of love. God can't prevent us from doing stupid things, but God can love us through doing stupid things and help us, you know, turn ourselves in a new direction. So um, I do think, uh, I think God suffers out of an abundance of love. I think we can create suffering out of selfishness um, and out of a small mindedness sometimes. Um, and yet there's just a part of life that will break down and suffer because we are finite beings. We are contingent beings. Our lives are not meant to be here at infinitum. We are created for something more. And I think we do better to focus on what am I part of what am I created for that is more than what I am right now? Beautiful, thank you. Um, okay, so what are your thoughts about the double slit experiment and its insights that matter responds to our confirmation bias 
as to whether light behaves as a particle or wave or both? And then would this be an example of how the universe is psychic in the language of Deschardins? Wow, that sounds like a question that could land me a Nobel Prize someday, actually. <laughs> you know, I think the, the questioner needs a Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, there, there is quantum physics. I just want to step back and say this is an area that there's a lot of discussion. There's no one model of quantum physics. I, I think I just need to put it out. There's, there's about 20 different models of quantum physics. Uh, the Niels Bohr model is one of uh, the double slit experiment is certainly one that's you know, uh, used quite frequently. All we're just seeing in quantum physics, and here's maybe just why I wanna step back and saying this, that it is a world of superimposed potentialities. That's all we're saying here. It's a world of potentialities um, and that nothing will come into being unless there is an act of determination, whether it's by a measuring tool or an observer who's using that tool to make a determination. So what we're saying here, there's no fixed reality, there's no fixed forms, that we live in a world of pluripotentiality and therefore the act, the role of the observer takes on an active role in, in, what, in what is create, being created. Um, and that's all we're saying here. And, and by matter, the psychic dimension of matter, because a lot of scientists today are just waking up to what we call panpsychism or dual aspect monism. In other words, there's a psychic component of materiality. Scientists for forever just, you know, put mind on the side and study, you know, matter as just objects. These are just objects and I'm going to just study its parts. Now we're just discovering a whole new way that nature works, that it has understanding, it has some kind of intelligence to it. So I think I don't want to answer any question like that too readily because um, the science itself is in massive sea change. Um, and I think we need to be in dialogue on, on what's taking place so that we can begin to understand how, how God is, um, again, dynamically at work creating and allowing the freedom of God for this beautiful creation to unfold in such incredible ways. Thank you. So here's another great question. Can you say that Jesus points beyond himself while at the same time participating in that to which he points, which is to say a bigger emphasis needs to be placed not on an anthropocentric worship, but directed to the creator to whom Jesus points, while at the same time sanctifying the human person as part of God's creation? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, actually. And, and you know, a lot of scripture would, would I think, support that. Jesus never really was self-reverential. He was constantly pointing away from himself toward God the Father, toward, you know, that which is to come. And therefore, I think Jesus himself, you know, saw his work. I have done what is mine to do type thing, you know, but he was part of what God is doing uh, in the active sense, you know. So we sometimes, you know, the way our Christology is formulated is we wrap it all up in Jesus and he's going to save us and we're all going to go to heaven and hang out and have ice cream and stuff like this. And um, rather there's something more. And Jesus, I think, you know, is truly God. And what we're saying is God is act was active and alive in Jesus's life. And that same God is active and alive in our lives. And where Jesus, you know, points to is where we're going to as well. There's, and maybe the way to look at it is entanglement is a good term. You know, that Jesus being entangled with the Father, we are entangled, we are caught up in those, in those relationships of, of active, active dynamic love. And so, yeah, I would say pointing toward, there's an anticipation. In other words, there's something yet to be, um, to be realized, and we're part of that realization. And that's why I don't think we should treat the problems of our age like over and done, you know, my God, it's all going downhill, you know, it's all going to be over. No, it's all being, we have to think it's all being created and we are part of what it's being created. It's how we're thinking about these questions that really needs to shift. Another question here. Please comment on the relationship between uh, Teilhard de Chardin's theological insights and Alfred North Whitehead's process theology. Yeah. They were contemporaries and both were scientists. They point to a deep dialogue between science and religion. 
Yeah, great question. Um, I, I see Taylor Desjardins and Alfred North Whitehead as contemporaries, um, two process thinkers. In other words, they are what we would consider process theologians, meaning that the, um, the basis of their theologies is relationship, relationality. Um, Teilhard, uh, uh, I think, let me back up and say, I think Whitehead had a more developed metaphysics of relationality. He was a mathematician, he was a philosopher, um, and therefore I think he had a slightly more this um, better description of process, uh, process thought. Teilhard was not, so Teilhard would always tell us, I'm a scientist, I'm not a theologian, I'm not even a philosopher. I just went to Jesuit school, I was in the novitiate, I had some theology, but here's what I'm thinking. So I am a scientist who's thinking uh, about the things of God. That's different from Whitehead who's saying, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking very deeply about, I'm reading Plato and I've read Aristotle, I've read all the philosophers and here's, you know. So they're, they're both process theologians, they're complementary, and I've used both of them quite honestly. And I won't even tell you where I draw from Whitehead and where I draw from Teilhard at times. You'll just find, <laughs> you'll find the Delio mix. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're liking it, so keep it going. Um, another question here, which is, uh, Simple, but I think complex too. How would you define prayer and its purpose? That's a great question. Isn't actually. that a great question? That's a great question because actually I, I continue to think about Teilhard's vision um, and uh, contemplation. You know, for the, for the ancients and certainly much of our theology in the early church grew out of contemplative prayer. Uh, up until the it rise of scholasticism, most theology was a form of prayer, you know, uh, and therefore for, I have begun to shift prayer uh, into a, a beingness, a listening to uh, the, the material world, to, to just resting in nature, uh, to, to resting with God in and through this, uh, the beauties of creation. Um, and I guess what I, what I realized more and more, because I was trained, began in a monastery, uh, and I think a lot of our prayer can still be taking us away from the material world toward the spiritual, you know, and we find ourselves kind of the Augustinian, I love Augustine, but, you know, I withdraw from the world, I enter within myself, and I raise my mind to God, which is how we think about prayer. And I want to say, no, lose yourself in the material world. Go out and embrace the tree and just stay there. I think that's what Francis of Assisi did, by the way. I think he really just hugged a tree for about a week, you know, or he just held, held the bird in his hand for a whole day. That prayer uh, to contemplate God in this way means we are finding God in all things and we unite with that God and therefore we become a new being in and with that creature. Um, it's a new form of creativity, a new way of discovering uh, God in and through matter. So I think prayer needs to change slightly as we take on a new mattering of God um, in this new, this new day. There are so many great questions, and I want to apologize to folks uh, for not getting to all of them. But there was one that popped out at me here uh, that I think we could end with. Uh, give me a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's from Rebecca. Rebecca, how on a basic day-to-day -day level do you maintain your sanity, love for humanity, even as others continue to destroy creation? I think all of us would like to hear your answer to that. You know, I am aware of, first of all, I am very aware. I am just attentive to where I am uh, I try to be mindful of my own actions um, from the smallest things, by the way, to, you know, um, lifting earthworms. And I still, I do that now. I practice what St. Francis taught um, to, to, you know, for disregarding the poor. I mean, you know, so I think our attention needs to deepen. And certainly my attention has been changing. Um, second, I truly believe that the goodness of God, the love of God is ever faithful, that, that God is deeply present with us, that God is inviting us to, to free ourselves from the many strictures we have 
confined ourselves in and to be creative, to find new ways to be together, to live together. Um, and therefore, uh, I know we, we talk a lot about consumerism. I think consumerism and the lures of technology are because we have a crisis of transcendence. We have no place to truly lose ourselves. And so we go into cyberspace, we go online and buy a whole bunch of stuff. But if we could create new forms of community, and I just think, truthfully, I think we need to lighten up. We need to, we need to laugh more. We need to celebrate every aspect of the goodness of life, even if we're having a bad day. You know, I mean, I had a bike accident last year that I'm still recovering from a head injury. But I tried to take each moment of each day, and I am so grateful to live with gratitude, deep gratitude for every breath that we have and stop looking about on the negative side of things. Yes, it is bad. I'm not saying it isn't, but it's not over. It, this, is not, this is not an over and done universe. God is inviting us to wake up, to get up, and to create something new together, to, to get, you know, get over what, what different, what distinguishes us or separates us that binds us away from one another and find what unites us together. And to reunite with this beautiful earth. I mean, it does, you don't have to be a, a PhD, a theologian. You just have to be uh, one who sees the goodness of God in the very simple ordinariness of life. Thank you, Sister Ilya. That, that was just an amazing ending and an amazing talk. And as I said, the, uh, the chat and the question boards have lit up. So you, you have touched a lot of us tonight. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that these uh, slides and the, present, the, the, the presentation was recorded. We will make the slides available to you. Um, so uh, again, very much uh, grateful for your, for your wisdom that you've been able to share with us over this last hour or so. Uh, before our final prayer uh, by Sister El Mary Ellen, I wanna take a few minutes just to acknowledge the extraordinary work of all of the presenters from Cardinal Supage and Marine Day on Tuesday night through the experts in our workshops and presenters last night and certainly tonight. It has been an amazing couple of days and I can't thank you all enough for enduring yet more uh, Zoom meetings. I want to acknowledge the support and the hard work of staff and the administration of, of our partner, Creighton University, especially Dr. Dan DeLeo, who is actually pulling double duty as a faculty member at Creighton and a longtime member of our, of our Covenant team. Turning to our team, I must acknowledge the Covenant staff who have worked for over a year to put this conference together. I have my doubts that there exists in any other organization a more dedicated, professional, smart, funny, warm, and caring team. I get up every day grateful not just to do this work, but to do it with such amazing people. Uh, as you can see, the covenant is hitting on all cylinders, or maybe I should say has all of its solar collectors contributing to the mission. Let us continue to help uh, you with your ministry as you help us expand this network, a network dedicated to hearing and responding in love to both the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor. Again, and most of all, thank you for being with us these past three days, and especially for your dedication to caring for our common home. So Mary Ellen, I now turn it over back to you to uh, close us with a prayer, and we will say goodbye, and, uh, but, but not, uh, not forever. We'll be back in touch real soon. So Sister Mary Ellen? Yes, thank you. So I invite us all to pause for a moment on our time together and prayerfully hold in our heart the journey that we've been on these, these past few days, letting in all that has touched us, letting in what has surprised us, inspired us, maybe even confused or challenged us. And so we pray, creator of the universe, we hold those who are struggling to find food, water, a home, fresh air to breathe, peace of mind and heart. We hold our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews whose future is threatened as a result of our living in a way that pushes the planet beyond its limits. We hold those who are working to end the suffering of people who endure racial, environmental and economic injustice, poverty and sickness. 
and we hold all those who are making choices, taking baby steps and bold leaps of faith that reflect care for our common home and all its human and non-human inhabitants. God of light and shadow, teach us to be satisfied with enough. Strengthen us to trust in your unconditional love for us, just as we are, as we move into new and unfamiliar territory. Grant us courage to speak up and speak out in the spirit of St. Catherine of Siena in a million voices so that injustice of any kind doesn't grow because of our silence. Inspire us to use our natural gift of storytelling, to build relationships, to break open hearts and minds and to celebrate the fact that we belong to one another. Open us to move beyond our personal awakening to our collective awakening as community, as nations and as a species. Holy One, may we grasp the significance of our role as co-creators with you May we use our gifts, our life experience, and even our brokenness to bring about a culture of cooperation that opens up the future to hope and incredible energy. May we fall in love with and humbly stand in awe of your creation as you lead us into a way of living that embraces our deep interconnectedness to all that is. And we ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit who gives life to the world, and all God's people say, amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Marilyn. Bye, everybody. God bless. We'll see you soon. <laughs>